The G7 has warned Russia of massive consequences if it launches an attack on Ukraine. Joining us now to discuss this is the political analyst and professor at Curtin University, Joe Syracuse. Joe, let's get your thoughts on this. What's he playing at here, Putin? Is it about NATO? Is it about a land grab? Is it about sending a message? What's going on? Good morning, Pete. Uh, well, it's unfinished business as far as he's concerned. Look, on Tuesday, um, President Biden and uh, President Putin went eyeball to eyeball over Ukraine, and President Biden blinked. At the end of that interview, uh, Putin was convinced that he could do what he wanted, and the president made it very clear for the first time I've ever heard that military force was not on the table. He was threatening Putin with other things. Putin, as I say, has unfinished business there. He wants, uh, he's, he's a revanchist. He wants Ukraine back in what uh, some kind of uh, Russian empire in Putin's mm. mind, and uh, wants to protect the Russian-speaking people there and all the rest of it. Of course, what he wants is uh, he wants uh, neutralization of, of NATO. He wants the G7 to guarantee that. And of course, everybody's threatening him with pipelines and, and banking bans and things like that. Putin could care less about this. Look, Pete, before that phone call, before the G7 met this week, chances mm -hmm. of war in the Ukraine were about 50-50. Today, they're about 60%. So I think we're looking at a major war. And I think uh, we're going to have to lay the blame here at the uh, president's feet. Look, the G7 did something else, too. Um, that is with uh, France has uh, has made it very clear to uh, to President Biden that uh, France and many European countries are not going to be following the so-called diplomatic boycott. This is uh, mm. Macron's first chance to stick it to the Americans, the British, and the Australians. He said the, the boycott was insignificant and wouldn't do a damn thing. So what he signaled to the Chinese was, is that the French are going their own way on this one. So uh, yeah, all these just, efforts to join. Go ahead. Okay, well, just a couple of points on Russia. I mean, does, does, does Putin have some legitimate concerns here? I mean, there's more countries in the eastern part of Europe turn their attention to NATO. Is, I mean, is... Is he within his rights to get concerned about that? Oh, absolutely. Look, uh, uh, there was a terrible mistake done after the Cold War, which ended on Christmas Day of 1990. That was the encroachment of NATO on uh, Russia's borders. Uh, every nation that joined the European Union uh, became a member of NATO by uh, automatically, like frequent fire points. And pretty soon we got up to Ukraine, the last country. Uh, next to Russia. And so I think Russia has very legitimate, very legitimate concerns. As I like to point out, if the uh, Americans found Russian battalions on the, the boundary of Canada across Niagara Falls or across El Paso, we'd have a war in 10 minutes. So, you know, there are legitimate concerns here. And of course, um, uh, Ukraine is, is angling for membership in the EU when he wants to get, get into NATO. I'm afraid that's not yeah. going to happen. But, uh, just, and the, just quickly, too, would, would, do you reckon it, it would be an option to switch the gas off? That, that, that wouldn't be, would it? To switch the gas off? Yeah. Well, look, um, that would be a very bad idea for this yeah. reason. Number one, there'd be a lot of cold people in Europe this winter. Especially and winter, number yeah. two, we would drive Russia right into the arms of uh, China, who will provide them with alternative everything. True. So I, I think that's a very bad idea. But, you know, uh, and, and Putin has got a free hand. He's got the green light to do what he wants to do. And so uh, he probably will. Uh, as I yeah. say, the president's had a very bad week in, in the yeah. area. Of Joe, we'll leave it there. Yeah, no, there was, uh, it was um, um, someone who, who mentioned that the other day. I was reading about turning the gas off, and I thought, ooh, well, that's, that would be a big call. But, um, and also unlikely. G7 ministers have warned Russia of massive consequences and a severe cost if it invades Ukraine. The Kremlin has denied plans to attack and has accused the West of being gripped by Russia phobia. Miles from Westminster and all its woes, the Foreign Secretary could stride the world stage, corralling her G7 counterparts to unite against Russia's threat to Ukraine. There was a determination, she said, to act with one voice. What we've seen this weekend is very much a united voice from the G7 nations who represent 50% of global GDP being very clear that there would be massive consequences for Russia in the case of an incursion into Ukraine that would carry a severe cost. The meeting of the world's leading seven democracies' foreign ministers closed with a final statement reinforcing that message. 
any use of force, it said, to change borders is strictly prohibited under international law. Russia should be in no doubt that further military aggression against Ukraine would have massive consequences and severe cost in response. Russia denies it's planning to invade its neighbour with tens of thousands of troops deployed on or near its border with Ukraine. Western intelligence says an invasion could be imminent. And on the ground, there are some signs of Russian-backed rebels preparing for deeper conflict. All that's been enough to spur G7 ministers to overcome differences and take a stand. Despite the disunity of recent G7 gatherings, at these meetings we're told there was a steely resolve to stand together and send a clear message to Russia that no country can change the borders of another through force. One country can't dictate to another country its choices, its decisions, and its foreign policy with whom it will associate. One country can't exert a sphere of influence over others. That what, that's what Russia is purporting to, uh, to assert. And if we let that go with impunity, then the entire system uh, that pr provides for stability, prevents war from breaking out, yeah. is in danger. G7 foreign ministers must now decide exactly what massive consequences and severe cost means, what sanctions can be threatened to deter Russia from invading. Twelve people have been injured at a school near Moscow after a teenager allegedly detonated a homemade bomb. The suspected bomber, who's currently in intensive care, is an 18-year-old former student of the school. The blast occurred at a school attached to an Orthodox convent about 105 kilometres outside Moscow. Local media reports suggest the 18-year-old may have been motivated by hatred of the school's teachers and nuns. A newly revealed document shows the Australian government tipped off the US about a plot to assassinate JFK. A new release of 1,500 documents from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. reveals this extraordinary piece of history. Let's go to our US correspondent, Annalise Nielsen, now. Annalise, good morning to you, good afternoon where you are, but what does this document reveal? Well, this is a pretty extraordinary document in this trove of 1,500 that have been released by the National Archives. There's been pressure for years for the National Archives to release more documents relating to the assassination of former President JFK. One of the reasons they haven't is because it was deemed so politically sensitive at the time, of course, and so this is why we're learning more. But in these documents, there's one that actually refers to crank calls, as they were described, being made to an Australian Navy official, official in Canberra in 1963. In this report that was passed on to the CIA and revealed in this document, they described someone who said that they were a chauffeur for the Soviet Union. And in that, they've said this individual, while discussing several matters of intelligence, interest touched on the possibility that the Soviet government had financed the assassination of President Kennedy. Reference was made in this cable to the receipt of a similar anonymous call on 15 October 1962. Now, the assessment was that these were crank calls, but passed on as a matter of caution in that they described that there was $100,000 being paid for a Soviet official to assassinate JFK. Now, it doesn't seem that the US took this seriously either, assessing that this was a crank call as well, but it's certainly adding to the extraordinary fabric of this whole story of the assassination of JFK.